Good evening and welcome to the Literaturhaus Berlin Digital Program. I'm very happy that tonight Yvonne Uvo will join us from Kenya to present her book The Dragonfly Sea or as the German title reads Das Meer der Libellen. She will talk tonight to El Nathan John and tell us a little bit more about her novel and her um, upcoming time in Berlin because she's a fellow at the DAAD um, fellowship program here in Berlin and she will hopefully soon come to the city to join us here. Um, tonight she will be translated into German by Astrid Giese and I'm very happy to welcome all the three of them here at the Literaturhaus Berlin digital program. Enjoy! Mm -hmm. Hello everyone and welcome to this amazing event from the Literaturhaus Berlin. I'm here with Yvonne at the Ambo War talking about her amazing novel The Dragonfly Sea. Yvonne, welcome to this uh, very special program holding on the very special circumstances. How, how is it over there Thank in Kenya? You. Uh, we, we're kind of getting on as we always do. That's great to hear. Great to hear. I'm, I was very thrilled to, to receive your book, The Dragonfly Sea, uh, many months ago. I, I'd read it before and, and I, I got another copy because I was preparing for this, this event. Um, w one of the things I want to start with is, is introducing you, but I will also introduce the novel. So for those of us who are listening, uh, Yvonne Adiambo Owuo was born in Nairobi, Kenya. She studied English and history at the Kenyatta University and earned a Master of Arts degree at the University of Reading, UK, and an MPhil from the University of Queensland, Brisbane. From 2003 to 2005, she was the director of the International Film Festival in Zanzibar, under the remit of which a literary forum was established. The Kenya-based literary magazine Kwani, co-founded by Binyavanga Wainaina, published her short story, The Weight of Whispers, which earned her the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2003. Yvonne Awar's fragmented, poetic, fast-paced, and emotionally charged style continued with her acclaimed debut novel, Dust, which was published in 2014. This book recounts the history of Kenya, and in it, uh, Yvonne Awar reveals the hidden and often painful consequences of amnesia, national rebranding, re political betrayals in the form of a collection of individual scenarios with a disrupted family from the north of Kenya at its center. Her new novel, The Dragonfly Sea, is one of the first from the continent to fictionally explore what the return of China to Eastern Africa might mean for intimate histories and memory of East Africa's maritime people. It is a young girl's coming of age story that was stirred by actual events. Yvonne has started to work on a new coffee-inspired story with the working title, The Coffee Mistress, which she will develop further through her DAAD Artists in Residency, which begins this month. And we, we, we very eagerly await uh, Yvonne's arrival <laughs> in, in Berlin. Uh, Yvonne, we've, we've also uh, introduced this, this, this uh, uh, amazing new novel, and, and it's been called Dazzling. It's been called an amazing coming-of-age tale. I want us to start from the from the very beginning. Um, now, in your previous novel, Dust, which was set against the backdrop, as we've said earlier, of the 2007 Kenyan presidential elections, you sort of whisk us onto a dry landscape, which you describe in, in, in quite <laughs> remarkable detail, both on the level of setting and on the level of, of metaphor. We see the beautiful, you know, physically arid, albeit beautiful landscapes, but also we see the arid on a metaphorical level, political landscape of, of Kenya. Now mm -hmm. you have sort of ferried us to an island, to the sea, to the ocean, <laughs> where <laughs> cultures and worldviews collide and confer. I, I, I want to ask you a question. Are you, are you interested in what I call the big metaphor? You know, water, dust, the sea, oceans. What's your relationship to this what I call a big metaphor, this, these big thematic metaphors. Okay. Uh, first, thank you for your question. And thanks, thank you to the Literature House for this uh, opportunity and a special wave to the German readers that have been amazingly supportive of my works for so long. Uh, Nathan, going back to your question, I, 
I wish I could say, yes, I, I, emphatically, I am interested in the big metaphors. Um, but I, I'm afraid that the big metaphors, the element, the, actually the elements, uh, the elementals uh, look, look for me. They seek me out and then whisper their own stories. Um, more uh, pragmatically, I'm an outdoorsy kind of human being. Um, I love the landscapes. And this particular story, the Dragonfly Sea, is an ode to the ocean that I particularly love. Uh, the ocean I met when I was seven years old and has turned me into a sea haunted uh, human being. So yes, in, in that way, the metaphor, it's less, less about the metaphor, more about the, uh, the longing and the yearning for the spaces that I love. Now we will come back to the ocean. Um, I would mm -hmm. go to the epigraph of this amazing book just before you know you will you will have the opportunity to read for for all of us. Um, mm -hmm. Now you have in this epigraph an amazing poem by the 19th century Swahili poet Moana Kupona Bintim Sham. Um, yes. Which which was from the larger text uh, Utendi wa Moana Kupona. You know, oh, no. Yes. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and I was wondering why you first why you chose this epigraph. I mean, I know that this this poet was was born on on Pate Island, where this novel is partly mm -hmm. based. But but then why right. did you choose this particular part? And I noticed that you you adapted it, and I want to, you to yes. talk talk us through this adaptation. But but just so people know what I'm talking, because it's very short, I would just like to read out two lines from this. Yeah, and it says, take mm -hmm. this amulet child and secure it with cord and honor. I will make you a chain of radiant pearl and coral. I will give you a clasp, fine without flaw, to wear on your neck. Wash and perfume yourself and braid your hair. String jasmine and lay it on the counterpane. And, and I find this f so beautiful. So why did you choose the, these parts? And, and what's your connection to the larger work? Well, the larger work is exquisite and it's an incredible exhortation as well as a, a, a kind of a, what's heirloom, a, a mother leaves to her daughter. She wrote it when she th thought she was going to die and it was a kind of last, uh, last will, last lesson to uh, her, her daughter, her beloved daughter. And when a Kupona Bintim Sham was such a legendary presence on Pate Island herself, um, a, a leader among uh, both men and women. And I, I, uh, the, the multiple reasons um, I chose that. First, it was so appropriate in terms of its uh, uh, condensation of the culture of the space uh, in, in very few words. Uh, and, and secondly, it's a mother-daughter uh, engagement that um, is also a feature in this particular book. Uh, and, and thirdly, was that for far too long, the there's been a, a very strange assumption, maybe by some of the wretches that entered into the space, that there was absolutely no cultural expression, no artistic um, articulation uh, from those particular worlds. And if there was any, um, it was either by the Arabs or by any stranger who walked into the space. So um, in a way, it's a kind of laying out of uh, planting a little stake um, to, you know, uh, you know, yeah, a kind of planting a little stake in uh, and a, a minor correction in a lot of the historical nonsense that has been going on. Thank you very much. Now, I have one more question on this epigraph. I mean, in the epigraphs yes. in each of the chapter, you begin mm -hmm. with a, the epigraph in the original language, and then you translate it into mm -hmm. English. I noticed that you didn't mm -hmm. do the same for this first epigraph. Is there a reason for that? I, I, I think it was simply about, more about space. I was going okay. to, and, and permission, space and permissions. Mm -hmm. Yes, permissions, mm. very, very, yes. very, 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 very important <laughs> for, for writers. So I, I wanted those who are listening to us to have a feel of the novel, the texture of the writing, where we are in, mm. in time, but also where we are in this historical space that you create. Now, do mm. you mind giving us a first reading? 
But before that, set the reading up for us. What are we seeing? Who are we speaking to? Okay. Uh, in this particular scene, what has, uh, uh, what has happened before is the little girl Ayana has uh, identified and targeted uh, this uh, kind of taciturn and uh, grumpy seafarer who himself has come back to Pate Island, uh, ostensibly to retire and do nothing. Um, and he has been averse to relationship. But she, this little girl had targeted him and decided that he was going to be her father. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, in, the, in this scene, what simply happens is, um, uh, oh, oh, and, and before that, the previous scene, what happened was her mother, um, uh, Munira, uh, the little girl's mother, had had to come to terms with the fact that uh, her little girl had appointed for herself a father and they were going to have to share her. Um, the father, Muhyiddin, this, uh, this poor man, Muhyiddin, has of course decided, okay, he, since he has no choice in the matter, uh, because the Ayana is very persistent, um, he will do the least he can um, to fulfill uh, the calling to which he has you know, directed him uh, and, has, and has created boundaries. The part I'm going to read is the part how the uh, is the part where all these boundaries kind of fall apart in, in an incident. I hope you enjoy it. Yet within 12 days, these boundaries were breached by a gut wrenching howl at dawn, a wretched being in elemental agony. Island doors were flung open, footsteps rushed toward the source and faltered. A mother in a flowing cream robe, her hair dishevelled, feet bare, flew to the site of the crime and fell over her thin little daughter, who was cradling a ragged corpse with a crushed skull and a wet tail. A dirty white kitten. The girl was baying, her face mucus streaked, bloody and mad muddy. The mother, hand to head, was sobbing. Why hurt this useless thing? Who did it offend? And men and women watched or turned away. Some sniggered. Others who knew or had seen which of their children had been involved crept away. Though they would pinch those children's ears, nothing else would be done. Muhyiddin appeared. He absorbed the scene. He saw a crushing sorrow, too old and too adult for a child to bear. So he seized the child, trying to absorb the anguish. He enclosed her and her dead cat in his arms. Both were still cold and frozen. Why, whimpered Ayana. She expected Muhyiddin to know. He done nothing bad, so why? Muhyiddin squeezed her. He glanced at Munira's tear-streaked face as Ayana said, You fix him. She told Muhyiddin, Tell him, move. Her eyes were clear in her certainty of his power over life and death. Muhyiddin swung his body to face the fitting audience. Someone saw something. His hands were fists. No one answered. He roared. Who is responsible for this? Speak. No one looked at him. Within a minute, everyone had slithered away and abandoned the trio and their small corpse. That evening, after Muhyiddin and Munira had cleaned up the kitten, they wrapped it up with strips of pink silk and inserted it in a large perfume box. They carried this to Munira's gardens near the tombs. Muhyiddin dug a hole next to the light colored roses. Ayana's eyes were fixed on Muhyiddin as he then turned the pages of the Hafiz poetry book he had carried, hiding his helplessness behind others' words. Abira, he suggested, stopping on a page. Read this. Ayana closed her eyes. Muhyiddin said, Kitten needs to hear your voice as he jumps to the uh, uh, stars. No, yelled Ayana. Muhyiddin crouched next to her. 
Why no? She pointed. Him. He's not moving. See? Mohidin glared at the whole hollow earth. He lied. He said that the kitten was already a wave, a star, and one of the beats of Ayana's heart, and that to be these things, the kitten had put aside his body. He said now the kitten could even grow into a tree. He added that whether the tree would yield one or many more kittens would be up to the tides and the winds. Ayana whispered into his right ear, even me, I can be a tree also. Muhyiddin almost wept. Not yet, Abira. His arms were on her shoulders. Solemn-eyed, Ayana stood inside all her unanswerable questions. Muhyiddin frowned at the tombstones and waited. Finally, Ayana asked, Is this dead? The strain for the correct answer distorted Muhyiddin's face. The yes was wrenched out of him. That was the closest he came to howling. Ayana asked, dead is not moving? Muhyiddin cleared his throat. Yes, a ghost of worn human sadnesses imbued with newborn dread loneliness inched into Ayana and found a space where it could gaze out at the world from within her eyes. The look would never leave her. She lowered her head. They waited. You read, Ayana at last whispered. So Muhyiddin read her fears over a small hole in the ground which would later become a mound and did something he never imagined he would ever do. He mourned a kitten. Greet yourself in your thousand other forms as you mount the hidden tide and travel back home. He could not continue. Little fingers, Ayana's hand inside his, they stood silently and waited for nothing. Monira, watching from the sidelines, struggled with jumbled sensations, the oddness of experiencing one battle she did not have to carry alone, the sight of her daughter's fears enclosed and offered solace. Monira bowed her head, still expecting an inevitable blow. Preoccupied, the trio missed another watcher, a stranger who often came to the ancient graves in the evenings to sit close to and address their contents. He turned to focus on the child whose slanted eyes were shaped exactly as his own. Thank you. Amazing reading. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for this reading. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was that, of course, the end about the slant eyes of this woman, which eventually leads to the revelation that takes her um, um, to China. Now, but before we, before we get there, we are in the island of Pate. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us about Pate, this island off the coast of Kenya where this novel is set. Um, I know it's the largest island of the Lamu archipelago. Uh, what is it about mm -hmm. Pate that drew you to this story? What is it about this particular connection to um, um, China that drew you to this story? Yeah, well, thank you for your question, Ellen. Pate Island is actually an island that uh, has suffered greatly in the kind of contemporary history. Even though it has this over thousand year old uh, interconnection with the world, this amazing place where literally time has stood still, you can walk into that space and, and run into a thousand year old uh, um, artifacts, living artifacts, actually, um, is actually the, uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's invisible in maps. You can look in, in, at contemporary atlases and find that Pate is missing. Yet it's, it's, it's a place where the so-called war on terror actually began. Uh, that, that, that particular idiot, is his name, Fazul, who launched uh, attacks on the uh, U.S. embassy in both in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, went to Pate to hide. Pate's reputation, it's the place where throughout history, if you ever wanted to change your life um, and, and abandon the past or abandon whatever it was that was haunting you, you fled to Pate Island. And, uh, and it's for this reason that when you go to the island, you literally meet all the world there. 
you know, uh, you know, those of Portuguese origin, those of Gujarati origin, but everybody is, of course, of Pattaya Island right now. So um, it's and 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 the, uh, you know, El Nathan, I was struck by the. Uh, the the narrative that was kind of going on mostly uh, mediated by um the uh, what we call the west about china's presence and return uh, china's presence on the african continent and the fact that the narratives were uh, were structured as if this was a new phenomenon mm. um i was also struck by the absences of our own kind of african perspectives and uh, I, I, it was when I was in Zanzibar that I ran into kind of fourth generation Zanzibaris of Chinese origin uh, that I was struck by what I did not know and what I did not understand. Pati Island, I'd always known um, through, you know, from our own history lessons that it had claimed all sorts of uh, connections with uh, all parts of the world, including China. And I remember I was struck by the strangeness of that. Uh, but when you go to Pate, you realize that's actually not strange at all. It's one of those in-between places, crossroads of the of the world, and uh, and 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 major entrepot for the uh, worlds of the Indian Ocean, or or what what we are now calling the Swahili Seas as well. Um, also laying our stake on those on the on those particular waters. So it, it's it's uh, it's a place that's and and our post in because the people the the, the Bajuni people are, are those that are linked to Pati Island are renowned for their stubbornness, uh, their pride, their sense of pride, and the, and actually and and rightly so because they've got this immense sense of history. Um, they they are not amenable to a lot of uh, government political shenanigans. So. Um, their fate has been that they've been neglected and marginalized, but that does not that ha, that does not ha, uh, you know change their sense of pride or their sense of history or their sense of dignity uh, either. And and I think the, there's the other thing about Pate is how beautiful it is, how hauntingly and amazingly beautiful it is, El Nathan. Uh, it, it, it's a site that uh, ideally I would I would so profoundly desire that especially um, people of African origin visit uh, and visit with tenderness uh, because it's a way of also connecting to some old, old, old histories. Pate is the one place you go to, you understand that the histories of our continent are deeper and far and, and, and very wide. Our contemporary preoccupation with the colonial era gets wiped out once you land on Pate Island. So, I mean, for, for these and a whole lot of other reasons, um, I would uh, you know, I would say that, um, you know, there's a good reason for choosing party. And quite frankly, quite simply, in response to the to what you stated earlier, uh, the, the thing that led this quest, uh, mm -hmm. it was simply that the the story of China in Africa actually is begins and is founded on Pata Island, where the Tang and Ming dynasty graves uh, and, and old settlements still uh, you know ruins or the, the ruins uh, still lie so great I, I i will ask you about islands in general related to fiction mm -hmm. but but since you've mentioned the ming yes. dynasty i know that while the the general inspiration for this book in part comes from the connection discovered between a certain inhabitant of Pati island and individuals from the Ming Dynasty of, of China who shipwrecked uh, hundreds of years ago, you take great care mm. in mentioning in, in, the, in the introduction to your book that this is not the story of the woman who, after DNA tests, was revealed to have been a descendant of this shipwrecked Ming Dynasty sailor. Um, yes. I, my question is, what what do you want the reader to come to, to to come to historical fiction, or to come to a reimagining of what you 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 create as a as a new world out of, so to speak, the shipwreck of this of this original story? I think it's it, I think the latter, the reimagination, and and if the reader then is interested in the kind of the, um, the reader is then invited into um, you know. Uh, finding other books, finding other references. And now uh, Dr. Mwamaka Sharifa herself is, uh, has returned to, to East Africa as, as, a, as a double doctor. Um, her own story is absolutely amazing. And I, I, I did not want to uh, lay claim to um, the, the richness and the wealth and the immensity of her own amazing story. So yeah. 
Yes, and for those who saw the, the image on the screen, uh, Dr. Muamaka Sharif, who that we talked about, was on the left of the screen holding the dragonfly C. Now, a, a few more things about this now that we're on it. You've talked about Africa-China relations as, in your words, and I will quote you, fraught with misunderstandings and unfortunate silences that contribute to a miscommunication that seems to restrict itself to trade, business, and the Baton Road Initiative of, of mm. China. You've also written mm. uh, that at the core of the Sino-East Africa relations um, mm. depicted in the novel is, in your words, human needing, searching, curiosity, mystery. And that once the veneer of geopolitics slips away, you find the older human question at play, who am I here, who do I love, how do I become? Now, I'm, I'm juxtapositioning mm. these two quotes to ask the question, how do you navigate the space between the personal and the political? You know, you say, for example, mm. at the end, that the personal and the intimate quest takes over once the veneer mm. of geopolitics goes, goes away. Mm. But you've also mm. mentioned how important this geopolitics is. How mm. do you navigate mm. the balance between these personal preoccupations and the larger mm. geopolitical questions? Uh, well, uh, I think you know uh, uh, as well as I do that the personal is also political. And um, the, the, if you want, if we're looking for ontologies of the geopolitical, it always starts, I think, I feel very strongly, it always starts with the individual. It starts with the personal. It starts with, the, in many ways, the intimate, uh, you know, the dreams, the desire, the, the yearning, the aspiration. So uh, I think that was, that was my uh, compromise, I guess, um, to enter into the ontology uh, where, it, where, where it begins. I, and I think sometimes the, the, the personal gets lost in the uh, abstraction and the conceptualizing uh, that then takes over. Uh, while at the heart of everything, uh, I maintain that at the heart of everything is the human being. Great. Now we'll come back to this, the human beings in, in your story, but not before I mm. ask you about islands that I wanted to ask earlier. Do you think there's a yeah. special quality of islands that make it the perfect setting for the kind of drama and adventure that we see uh, <laughs> uh, in this story? Is, is there something about islands that, that make human uh, beings act in a certain way? Yes, I think so. I, I really do think so, El Nathan. I, I know I become a better, I, I like to imagine I become a better human being uh, when I'm, I'm, I'm on islands or close to islands. Uh, and I guess it has a lot to do with the ocean uh, more than anything. And uh, there's a way in which uh, islanders uh, experience and gaze upon the world as if they are either an extension of the sea and the sea and, and their own island is a, or the sea is an extension of their own island. Uh, a kind of a, a maritime imagining, a looking at the world from the waters. And I think it's a very, uh, for me certainly, when I, the rare moments I'm able to experience that uh, uh, features a sense of expansiveness, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the noise, the the political noise that uh, uh, you know, and the trend-setting things that uh, uh, preoccupy our headlines fade away very quickly when I'm on an island. Great. So now that you've mentioned this island, it's, I think it's the right time to ask you about. I mean, you said once that since you saw the Indian Ocean at about seven. You thought it was the mm. most beautiful thing you had ever seen. So, I, yes. and you've said that this, the structure of the novel comes from a passion for the ocean, and, and you were referring to the Indian Ocean. And so, mm. I'm thinking also when you talk about Ayana, who is the, 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 the main character of the novel, it, it gets to a point where the, the turning point is when she, as you say, gives herself to the ocean. And so right. I'm, I'm thinking of these two things, as you've mentioned them yourself, you having seen this, this ocean and it <laughs> having this amazing impact on you and Ayana in, your, mm. in the novel, you know, giving herself to the ocean and saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to set off and, and do this. Uh, so what, mm. what, what, what connection, if any, should we draw between these two? <laughs> oh, no, no, just, I think, 
I, the character, and you know this very well, you know that characters have their own will and their own calling and their own, you know, they're inspired by whatever elements uh, fuel the story for them. So Ayana is her own kind of person. Um, but yes, maybe what I did, uh, what I could uh, uh, feed her with uh, was, is my own... Uh, Love, love, a kind of uh, unrequited yearning for, for the sea. I, I wrote a lot of that book uh, far from the ocean. So I could, uh, uh, so, so, uh, as, yeah, so the longing, my own longing to be close to the sea um, probably infuses um, her own um, immersion in those waters. Great, great. Before we go to the mm. next reading, um, I, mm. I wanted to ask you a question um, about the return of of Dr. Muammar Kasharif, who after being you have, after having been discovered to have some connection to to China, do you think that it mm. wasn't as big a story as it should have been in Kenya and around the world? That in this island, or on this island of Pate, um, mm. some connection existed between residents and a shipwrecked sailor 600 years ago, and that this connection mm. actually led to the return of one person to sort of explore their roots. Do you think it should have been a bigger story in the light of the um, geopolitical implication of, of all of that? Uh, absolutely, El Nathan. Certainly because it's a very uh, significant African story. It's, it's a story that um, uh, lays open our own long, long, long history. And I think the narrative of, of what China's return uh, to the continent, um, a, a, a kind of a, a renewal, a restart of an old relationship, um, would have allowed us as Africans to be able to, I think, uh, story this return in a more um, complex and more textured way, as opposed to handing over the telling of that story to um, others who have their own interests and who, uh, let me mention this up front, uh, even though Pate Island itself has been talking about their own connections with China, and, and, and uh, when you go to a place like Shanga or Siu on, on Pati Island, it's, you cannot deny, it, the, it's in the physion, physion, physionomy of the people. You cannot deny that old um, connection. It's in the tombs, it's in the, unfortunately, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, in, in, in the tombs, but the ceramics that were, uh, that had been laid in the tombs, which unfortunately, to be honest, have been stolen by um, so-called, maybe I shouldn't call them so-called historians. Uh, one of the questions I said, who took the, who took the, who took the ceramics? They said, you, you had all these visitors coming in, mostly from Europe, European thieves, I guess, uh, and, and they stripped the tombs of their ceramics. Uh, so you have, so the, Despite the evidence of that, El Nathan, even in history books, that has been denied. You know, competent historians have denied Pate's own um, narrating of itself. So it's in a, it, we should have, I think we should have paid greater attention, uh, uh, certainly um, as, as Africans and as Kenyans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. China oh. certainly did pay a great attention, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, yeah. and they arranged for, for, uh, for her to Dr. Bwamaka to, to return to China. They did that, yes? Yes, they did that, and, and, it, was a very, and it was a very emotional thing for them. It was more like a, a completion of a, a long, long mystery. Uh, literally, when, when we, we, we ha we've had talks, the way she was um, embraced, and uh, it, it was very emotional also for those um, that encountered her in China, and they made connections again using DNA with uh, some of those, uh, some of her Chinese, uh, you know, relatives, so to say. Uh, and, and she she met them and stayed with them, and she was pretty much embraced like a, you know. Let me put it this way. I think one of the most moving things she said it was as if they were now able to mourn after six hundred years. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow! Wow! Then, that's that, that, yeah. that's really interesting. So there's one there's mm. one more thing we'll do before we go back to the reading. I I noticed in that first reading, 
we t we had elements that that one might say were magical realist elements and you know the way she <laughs> she talked about changing and 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 all of that and and going through especially the parts in pate you see these magical moments do you think would mm. you agree that there are elements of magical realism in the novel i don't know i, I don't want to call it magical realism uh, although others might it, it's just it's 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 the it's um it's very much I guess uh, and I hope I did the, I maybe I did some justice to it. You enter into you go into the island and the and the veil between worlds is very very thin, very slender. Um, the 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 there is a space. There's plenty of room given to the non visible world uh, as part of a, a you know everyday reality. And people do have relationships. Uh, with what people would call the non-visible world, I, I love the cosmovision uh, of of the space, and uh, certainly for me um, as a uh, you know a person and an African and a Kenyan uh, looking for kind of other cosmology, not cos both cosmologies but also epistemologies uh, and ways of knowing. Uh, to encounter the fact that to to, to encounter the, a space where there so many other ways of of looking at and engaging with and sensing and being in the world and and knowing um is is, is very uh transformative yeah thank you very much so mm. if you're ready we would like to take a second reading and if you don't okay. mind could you set it up for us where are we who are we listening okay. to okay um, in, in this in this section, I will. It's I, Ayana has now gone to um, uh, uh, to Jamin, and she she originally was supposed to be studying uh, um, uh, Chinese medicine, but has decided that she will study navigation, uh, you know, marine navigation, um, and uh, and and she's now in class, and she had this illusions about what um, you know immersing herself in the study and the knowledge of the sea is um, but in her own experience a lot of questions also emerge um, so she's in the class with other um, other students who are also linked to the western ocean yeah all right um, <clears throat> ayana would learn that there seemed to be no absolutes in the world, only codes and questions and a guarantee of storms. In realizing this, she excavated echoes of a childhood conversation. She had asked Muhyiddin, what is good about water? Muhyiddin had said, storms. And then she asked again, what is bad about water? Muhyiddin had said, storms again. Now in class, Ayana stared miserably at her accumulation of the technical instruments with which she would analyze and eviscerate the unknowable sea. She raised her hand. She lowered it. What had she been about to ask? A matter of distances? The place of intimacy? What was the story of a human being within the epic that was the sea? She chewed on a finger and looked around and chose silence. She would have to relinquish her feeling for water to the power of numbers, navigational compasses, Napier's rules, coordinates, and geopolitics. She watched her lecturer. Could she propose that the sea sweats differently depending on the time and flavor of day and night? that there are doorways within the sea and portals in the wind, that she had heard the earth and moon and sea converge to sing as a single, as a, as a single storm born wind. And these had called her to dance and that she had danced at night with them under a fecund moon, a secret grin. She would be deported a shuffle of papers, a different image on the projector. The lecture on sea routes was proceeding with another elaboration of the Belt and Road Initiative. 
They were reviewing the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Suddenly, the lecturer called out Ayana's name. Badawi! Xiaoxi! Ayana jumped as the lecturer gestured. Shared future destiny, yes? The class turned to gaze at Ayana. Ayana shrunk in her seat, focusing on the sound of the slogans, honor in trade, prosperity for all. The lecturer continued, our Western Ocean is our gateway to mutual greatness. In the retelling of the life of Hersey, Ayana saw that the Maritime Silk Road Initiative had gobbled into Patty's place in the global monsoon complex. By her very presence, Ayana felt implicated as if she were betraying her soul. She sank further into her seat, also overwhelmed by the infinite land of infinite armies and infinite words and the machinery that at a signal could roll over skies, waters and earths to reach her home and cause it to disappear. She had come to school wanting to enter into the language of the seas through a people she was to imagine were her own. Instead, she was learning how the world was reshaping itself and her sea with words that only meant energy, communications, infrastructure, and transportation. Storm warning. Neither Pate nor the Kenya she had rarely thought about had acquired a vast enough imagination to engulf the cosmos that was writing itself into their center. Ayana suppressed a sigh and eavesdropped on the grumbles of the other foreign students who had resorted to petty territorial snipings that changed nothing. Her thoughts were in turmoil. One hot and humid day, Ari, a student of marine engineering from India, observed that the Maritime Silk Road Initiative subsumed the Indian Ocean. He had emphasized Indian to others. It is not for nothing that the ocean is called Indian, he noted. Ayana retorted, Zewaku. Ari turned to her, Oogle Boogle. Zewaku, Ayana refused to cede territory. Ari said, We'll discuss this with your good self the day your country acquires a motorboat to start a navy. Ayana said, Zewaku, and we have a navy. Doubtless, its fish bounties are commendable, but what else? Titters. Rat Nakara, said an Indonesian. Indian Ocean, emphasized Ari. Zewaku, repeated Ayana. Indian Ocean. Two Pakistani students chimed in. Zewaku. The class slipped into an uproar that did not change Chinese foreign policy. The lecturer who had watched the disintegration of order in his class in disbelief, his face becoming blotchy, at last screamed, The Western Ocean, you are in China. Western Ocean, murmured Ayana, looking at Ari from beneath her bangs as she doodled the word Ziwaku on her notepad, thinking about a kipate toponym, her heart pleased about the meaningless skirmish she had stirred. The lecturer was shouting out his points. Ayana returned to jotting down notes of another nation's imagination of her sea. One belt, one road, one road, she wrote. She would have to ask Muhyiddin what the different Kibajuli names of her sea were. Thank you. Thank you once again for that amazing reading, Yvonne. A, a few things come to mind as I was came to mind as I was listening to you read. Um, first, I must comment on what I would say are some of the most beautiful sentences I've I've read in in, in, in any novel. And and in fact, um, one you. of the the blurbs says that you write in heart stopping bursts of imagery and retooled language. And I completely agree with this. <laughs> and and so I, I want to ask how you relate with the sentence because I, I noticed that your work is really refined on a sentence level. Do you pay particular attention to how your sentences carry as, as individual um, things that have life? Because that's, that's the feeling I get. Oh, thank you, El Nathan. Thank you for that. Um, it, it's very affirming. I, 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 again, I, I, can't, I can't say 
how or what. I do love words and I do love the sound of words and I do sometimes hear the music uh, of the word of, of of the phrase before I, I write the word. So maybe that's that's that kind of influences that kind of seeps through. But thank you for your words. Yeah. So I, I, thank mm -hmm. you. I'm, one one other thing that you you read and I wanted to to, to read it back was when you talked about Ayana returned to jotting down notes of another nation's imagination for her sea. And I wanted to ask the mm. question about the sort of commentary you make here about naming, who gets to appropriate mm. sort of our collective commonwealth as humans and, and what yes. it says about yes. power and its operation in the world. Yes, yes. Um, it's... I, and and I, 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 you know, I think for most of our cultures, the the power, the, it's le uh, you know, I'm less preoccupied about you know the power relations. I'm more concerned about the loss of memory that happens when a name is erased, uh, and, and you know, the, uh, it's not even a palimpsest anymore. There's an erasure of history and an erasure of meaning. The the disappearances of the multiple names for the uh, I, I deliberately now call it the Swahili Sea um, it, uh, uh, that was then called by you know because of both Portuguese and and uh, uh, and uh, English fantasy of of access to India the Indian Ocean it's a it's a it's a actually a very recent very recent toponym probably you know seventeenth uh, century. Um, it means then that the agency, especially African agency, is cause is is you know is is made to disappear. Uh, you, you're talking about power relationship. The worst thing is the um, is the is the is the loss of more than just ancestral memory, but a historical agency. It because of the renaming and the erasure of any African, um, you know, toponyms and, and place names, geographical pla place names of, of these waters. It allowed some of these wretches to proclaim uh, and and uh, and in peer-reviewed articles that uh, the African relationship with the uh, with the ocean was as cargo on somebody else's boat. Or as artisanal fishermen on shorelines, and where Africans showed up in other parts of the world throughout history, even in India, in in in, in what becomes Iraq, although it was in Persia, it, all the way even to uh, you know Kazakhstan or and, and places of Turkey, and of course uh, you know in Lisbon, the assumption is that. As long as there was a, a, a dark-skinned person there, the their the ancestry was through slave through slavery. So, and 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 that gets repeated and reiterated so that the stories, for example, of some of the CD, um, I had the fortune of of inviting them to Zanzibar during the Zan when I was at the Zanzibar Film Festival. Their own ancestral stories of uh, going to India. Um, are linked to lives or as sailors, as teachers, as as merchants. Um, all of that is erased, uh, and and the assumption, even in uh, even in a lot of Indian history books, is that they were all there as slaves. Um, so it's it's more than political; it's actually contemptuous. The 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 removal of, of, of the rights of naming, not just the rights of naming, but some of the older names of the ocean get replaced by very contemporary interlopers that show up um, without too much sense. Thank you very much. Now, the many sentences are too many to, to, to talk about during this time that I thought struck, struck mm. me on a sentence level, but also connected to the theme of the book. So I was looking at the mm -hmm. sentence, Ayana would learn that there seem to be no absolutes in the world, only codes and questions and a guarantee of, of storms. And, and it mirrors what I think is like the ebb and flow of, of the narrative, how it, it gives and it takes, how things mm -hmm. get destroyed, how people go on journeys and return, and how there's always mm -hmm. an end to, 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 to each aspect of the narrative. Um, mm -hmm. Connected to that is the, the line that says, endings were a rehearsal for death, and death was in the constitution of life. So, so I'm, I'm wondering, these really amazing sentences, 
do you do you consciously think of them do they do they jump at us <laughs> no. because you want them to jump at us <laughs> no 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 <laughs> and i will be the <laughs> oh you know about these things el nathan you know damn well that you're you're not going to appropriate <laughs> the muse the muse the muse <laughs> i am merely an man who answers <laughs> no no and you know, sometimes I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm thinking, what? Did I write that? <laughs> well, that's, that's it's certainly good for you to like the sound of what you hear. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you one, one quick one, right? So, Lai Jin, yes. one of the Chinese characters in the... Jin Lai, yes. In the book. Jin Lai, yes. Jin Lai yes. Uh, talks about... Yes. He it's says... Reversed, yeah. Jin Lai says, events cast mm. shadows before themselves. And and I mm-hmm. and I raised this in in view of the comment that you made about these relations between China and East Africa not being new, these new discoveries mm-hmm. of 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 shipwrecked remains, of connections between mm-hmm. inhabitants on Pate and and China are not new. Even for example, mm-hmm. the geopolitics of the day, you you say is not new in in this in the same way you, mm-hmm. this. Official says events cast shadows before themselves. Um, would you want to right. speak a little more to that? To, to this, uh, what might be lost in the in the way the relations between China and East Africa are thought of today? Mm. You know, I think the uh, the greatest risk um, that we face in the in the structuring and the uh, uh, if you want, and in the in the reimagination of this relationship, is the 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 risk that is imposed by uh, what I call the the self. Um, how do you say it? Uh, what's that word? You know, when you introduce yourself into the scene, even though you're not needed. Uh, um, intrusion. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, by those who are not necessarily interested either in our welfare or certainly not, and as you can see in this kind of age, certainly not interested in in China's growth and who view China's presence in Africa as a kind of personal affront. The very same people who uh, in the year 2000, and I will always remember that, uh, wrote in The Economist in in reference to Africa, the doomed continent. But it was that same year that kind of the, the new relationship with China started getting consolidated. So, um, so if we and you know if as african as african peoples we do not claim our own agency our own history our own uh, you know our own possibilities linked to our relationship with china our own understanding because even when china came uh, at that particular time it was a it, it was a tribute kind of relationship it wasn't as necess- it wasn't necessarily a an encounter between equals um so uh, there are lessons that history offers us and i think as um you know africans who are interested uh, not only in the present but in the future um th- there's a vast world um of 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 of, of uh, you know both of messages but also and uh, but inspirations and possibilities um that lie untapped by us um and uh, which would actually probably give us a lot of leverage also in terms of our negotiation uh with um you know going forward in terms of de- defining and determining the future um so so th- there is that you know the idea of the events casting shadows um I, I must mention one of the most amazing human beings um i i recently encountered um the under um the marine archaeologist Caesar Bindo, who has dedicated his life to, um, a, a, you know, um, studying wrecks all along the Swahili seas, and who is uh, overseeing the the search for the remains of the uh, um, Admiral Zhongho's uh, wrecked yonk, uh, and he's probably going to be very successful in that enterprise. Um, and he's longing and yearning for um, an, an army of young, of Africans, uh, you know, young and old, to go underwater with him, to to dive into the depths and 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 cover the, our own histories, 
we've, 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 the, the artifacts, our, our histories are waiting for us uh, and, under the water and, 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 you know, under the water. But not many of us are bothered with um, going, you know, immersing ourselves into those particular depths. And I think that particular, uh, both, both an analogy and metaphor for our own possible, po the possibilities of our own relationships with China. I mean, the, 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 the in, it's almost an in inevitability, the idea of a, a Chinese century. Um, I'm mostly interested, my, my preoccupation, frankly, is what, you know, what does that mean for, for the African continent? What do we want out of this? Uh, you know, these are conversations we've never had. Uh, what do we want for ourselves? And how do we set, how, how can we gain from this? And what can we leverage in order to secure our own interests? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to ask now a, a question about writing and rewriting history. So when you come mm. to the novel with this huge, some maybe even unwieldy bag of 600 years of history between China and, and, and East Africa, or, or in this case, Kenya, how mm. far do you rely on, on the actual history? Because like you said in the beginning, this is not the story um, of the main character that we've talked about and we've seen in the photos. This is, is mm. a larger story. Um, how much do you de do you deviate from the actual history? Um, I, as, as part of my own research, I, I study the, the documents and uh, and um, uh, you know archives that are available that I can access. I do. I, it's in my own interest to immerse myself in what has been uh, found and, and what has been said. And having done that, I then put it aside and then uh, submit myself to the story. I, I, I let the story, if you want, tell me um, what it is. Um, and um, if there are aspects of history, I use his, fr frankly, I do use history as a palette, and maybe that's a, a little bit naughty. Um, but history is, you know, is, is, you know, is, is one, of, one of the colors of, on, on my palette of, of, of art. And in telling the story, I become just you know, arty, 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 farty, uh, and uh, get preoccupied with all those things that writing, uh, writing fiction preoccupies itself with. Um, and later on, I'll let the historians and other critics, you know, complain or do whatever. But yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so what, one final question about history. How do you deal with sources, especially knowing that not every source, especially when you're dealing with areas that were colonized and we talked mm. about naming earlier, things being named and renamed and stories being mm. erased. How much do you, mm. what do you, how do you know when to trust something and when not to trust it? Um, I, I, you know, Nathan, I think ultimately um, what I end up doing then is I go to people. I look for the embodiment, uh, embodied histories. I look for, I'm, I'm, I trust more in the memories of people and memories in community. Um, I, I take the texts and go to the, uh, the elders and the not so elders, those who are, who are kind of custodians of, of, of memory of history and story. And I ask them and, and, and where, and if, what they say does not gel with what is written, I will go with what they say. Um, it's kind of a, maybe a little act of rebellion. I'm, you know, I'm choosing our people. I'm choosing uh, the memories of our people. I'm choosing the archive of our own memory. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great. Thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. Now, before we mm -hmm. go back, I'm sure we'll, we'll get some more photos of this wreckage, and I'm sure it will come back on the screen. I, I, I want us to look back at the, the photo of the Cesar Mbindo, who's working on this important project that you've told us about, the retrieval, hopefully, of, of wreckage, and, and you've talked about our underwater histories. Now, I want to move mm -hmm. from that and talk uh, about metaphors let's let's look at craft mm. uh, you know in the final few minutes of of, of this uh, conversation so mm. my question is about metaphors in general in the beginning we talked about the big metaphor right and, and now right. historically i know that some philosophers used to be suspicious of of metaphors you know regarding them mm. as being mm. potentially weak some even say illegitimate and, and they rejected mm -hmm. magnificent metaphors as evasive mm -hmm. maneuvers to sort of bolster 
weak what they thought were weak points of argument now of course mm-hmm. this has largely changed and even philosophers have come back to to the you know the point of people in literature and they've begun to ap- appreciate you know the metaphor now mm-hmm. i'm thinking of the this category of sort of the, the dying metaphor and mm you know, Orwell in talking about the three categories of the living metaphor, the dead metaphor and the dying metaphor, which is um, metaphors that are fast going out of use. Do you mm-hmm. agree with certain people who might think that there might in some quarters be an over-reliance on metaphor and and that maybe sometimes in the words of uh, Kathleen Shine, that clarity is intellectual morality? Oh, well, that's 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 one opinion. Uh, when you go yes. to these islands, so, you know the whole kind of Swahili, the Swahili coast. They, 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 you know, there are certain times you can go into a space and it's the entire conversation is in metaphor, mm-hmm. and and it calls for a certain way, a kind of engagement, a deep engagement with uh, with you know with. Yeah, you know, it would have been deep, a muscular engagement with um, searching for the meaning as part of the game, as part of the grammar, as part of the, the exchange. And the idea and the fact that, you know, uh, uh, the the metaphors in, in, in some of these uh, in, in some of these spaces of a kind of 360 degrees. Uh, the Utendi, for example, is is notorious or famous uh, for its, uh, you know, double entendres and its uh, layers and its complexities and, and you know, and, 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 and the people weigh you up or down or sideways and, and it will tell you a completely different thing. Uh, the, 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 it, it is because of these metaphors that worlds, entire seas can be contained in, in a poem. Mm, uh, that's some of the things I learned from from encountering our Swahili seas and and encountering its its art and its history and its poetries. You know, you can carry entire worlds in in you know in a in a verse, um, and unless you, uh, I, I prefer I th- I think anyone who resists the metaphor, and maybe that's now um, cultural bias, mm-hmm. um, is probably inclined to a kind of. Uh, a, a, uh, you know, uh, you know, a reasoning laziness. Um, I find, um, as a person newly engaged with the oceans, uh, that the pleasure, some of the great pleasures of life, is in the um, meeting of a, you know, engaging and hearing and and trying to figure out what is actually said. Uh, yes. Well, thank you. And you know, one of the reasons why I asked the question was that I was going to ask a follow-up question about what this means then for the tools that we use to create narratives you know now we Mm -hmm. have these for example mfas that are essentially turned writing into this international project it doesn't matter where you come from you can come from pate island or come from brooklyn and you're in the same class Mm -hmm. teaching or learning how to tell stories in in similar ways do you think that Mm. we need more ways of storytelling being taught in schools you know in in mfa yes. programs that we create and curate yes Elvethan. yes 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 absolutely yes 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 uh, to what you say yes we do desperately urgently um uh, they, they so much that gets lost in the standardization of 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 method and Oh, let's not do that because there's there's such re- there's such there's such wealth uh, in, in the possibilities, yeah, yeah, that we haven't even finished looking at yet. I will go to the final question uh, because we're already running out of time. And oh, oh nice, okay, interesting. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> I, I would have wanted yes. to go on and on and on. Um, yeah. you've you've written about the, one of the most difficult parts for you. You said that um, Ayana's Turkish sojourn with Corey and his family was the most difficult <laughs> yes. to write. Yes. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to talk, talk us through that difficulty <laughs> on our way out? <laughs> um, on our way out? I have no idea where Corey came from. <laughs> and I had no idea. I, I, he kind of took over in 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 parts, and it's it's one of those moments where, as a, 
I forgot Binya Vanga's exhortation to me when I was struggling with dust, which was get the hell out of the way of the story. And mm -hmm. you have you and you have no business judging your characters. I start, I judged him and I judged her and I tried to change the trajectory of the story. And it was that one month where the story completely dried up, disappeared, mm -hmm. like fled me <laughs> until I had to go back and just, you know, and just kind of figure that out and allow Corey be, to be Corey mm -hmm. uh, and be in Ayana's life, even though I wanted to protect her from him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Any, is, is there anything well, we should be expecting from you soon? Ah, oh, not soon, but I mm -hmm. will be writing. I'm looking forward to coming to uh, my beloved Berlin to mm -hmm immerse myself in the new texts yes yeah well well we look forward to to welcoming you thank you very much yvonne war for these yeah. amazing amazing minutes um it's been a pleasure I, I would have hoped that you were here with us in berlin to have this conversation on the same oh, stage yes yes but, but yes, thank you so yeah. much for being generous with your time and i hope that um you come here soon and that you begin work on on this new new project thank oh, you very you much yvonne <laughs> Thank you, El Nathan, and thank you, everybody else. Uh, I, I do look forward to meeting you all in Berlin yeah. uh, in happier days, mm -hmm. COVID-free days. <laughs> yes, yes. And thank Perhaps, you to everyone yeah. who has been listening. Thank you for your time. We have been talking to Yvonne Adhiambo Awar, whose novel Dragonfly Sea, the Dragonfly Sea we've been talking about for the past 50, 60 minutes. Yvonne's other work can be found online. Her short stories have been published in several international literary magazines. Her first novel, Dust, won several awards. You should look at that as well. This is me, El Nathan John, signing out from the Literatur House, this amazing, amazing venue, and thanking you once again for being such an amazing audience. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, bye. If you enjoyed our program tonight, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can also donate a little bit of money to our account. You will find the uh, button on the website or also here on the YouTube channel of the Literaturhaus Berlin. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. <laughs>